So what it actually cost me was 40,000. Yet I got 3 million from that person. Did I do more than I'm supposed to? Did I get more than my right? I would think so, right? Because if I'm only doing 40 grand and I get 3 million out of it, then I went way over. And that's the problem with demanding your rights to the liability of forgetting about responsibility. It's very easy to get more than what you're supposed to get. Because when people are going after their right, are they happy or angry? Angry. So they're in a position, they're, they're actually weak. Why? Because now they're, they're open to getting more than what they need, more than what's due to them. لا أنا أخذ حقي وإيه ونص وزيادة What does that mean? يعني حقك وزيادة هو حقك وبس There's no زيادة here What happens when you do زيادة? You become مظلوم أنت أصلا مظلوم إيه اللي حصل بقى لما خدت زيادة دي؟ بقت إيه؟ ظالم ظالم من قلب المظلوم ظالم Just like that Just like that So it's a fine line between being مظلوم being the one who is wronged and then you flip to be the one who wrongs someone else. عشان كده ربنا سبحانه وتعالى بيقول إيه وأن تعفو أقرب للتقوى. Be careful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did he say to the people who came to him? لعل بعضكم ألحن من بعض في حج حجته أو إلقاء حجته. فأحكم له. Perhaps some of you are more eloquent in the way they present their case, and then I will judge for them. But that does not absolve you. In front of Allah. حتى إذا كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حكم لك. Even if he did it for you. Does it mean, however, that you're okay with Allah? Maybe you were more eloquent. Maybe you had a better lawyer. Right? Maybe you had Johnny Cochran as a lawyer instead of, you know, a public prosecutor. Daphne Johnny Cochran, right? It's before your time. That's Saqaf Ayan. So, in that case, you're wrong. That's why, slow down. Be careful when you're seeking your right. However, when you are fulfilling your responsibility to something, can you do too much? What if you do more than you're supposed to do? Are you, it's dangerous to do that? Let's say that someone, um, you, you, you work, you're an employee, and you stack crates and boxes at Amazon, and they tell you, you know, for you to get your salary, you need to stack 100 boxes per day for me. You did 110. Did you wrong anybody by doing 110 instead of 100? Nobody. In fact, this is Right? Even to pay back your debt with Yada. That's Ismu Ihsan. So, that means in our relationships, we should be much, much more focused on the idea, let me fulfill this responsibility, and let me even go a little bit over. Just like in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why do we do nawafil, salat and nawafil? Innaha jawab lil faraid. What does that mean, jawab lil faraid? It plugs the holes in your farad. You do your dhuha prayer and you're thinking about a million other things in your Instagram and your Snapchat and Sharfish and Netflix, and you only remember you know, half of a rak'ah. That means three and a half rak'ah, you weren't there. You were somewhere else. It's like you didn't do them. So we have nawafid, the before and after, salat al-layl, whatever it is, to plug those holes. So you do a little bit more, so you make sure that you at least get what you're supposed to do. When you make wudu and you're washing your arm, they tell us what to do from here. Do we stop at the elbow? What is each way? Go a little bit past. Why? To make sure that you got the elbow. Even though you did something, you don't have to do this part. But you did it to make sure you got everything right. You got what you're supposed to do. So in our relationships, we should also strive to do that. The Prophet when he's entering into Mecca, Fatih, our Fatih, Khalas, he sees a, a, a young dog and her pups and sees that the army might trample over them and separate them. Alumi, he said, be careful, don't, don't abuse that dog and the pups and the puppies. This is an army, 10,000 men. And he's telling him, don't worry about the dog and her puppies. 
Why? La zul. La zul. Even when you're seeking to do something right, you don't wrong someone else on the way there. You can't. It's like you ruin the whole thing. Right? We don't have this thing in the al wasail to barr al ghayat We don't have that. We don't have the, the means, to, uh, just to, the ends justify the means. That's Machiavelli. That's some crazy Italian European who came up with that, who wrote The Prince. We don't have this. The means are important. The ends are important. So we do both. So that means more important for your responsibilities towards others than to seek your rights from them, as we just established. Okay, so let's go back to men and women. We often talk about how men and women who have some type of attraction to each other, but that's not the only man-woman relationship. There's actually four, at least, that I counted. There's mother and son, that's a man and woman, no? Father and daughter, that's another man-woman relationship. Brother and sister, like blood brother and sister. And then husband and wife, right? And each one of those relationships has it has things that have to be right about them from both sides. So let's focus on the last one, right? Husband and wife, or let's say pre-husband and wife. What are some of the facts on the ground that are true? Starting at a particular age, boys and girls become attracted to each other. the haq. No one can deny that. It's normal. It's not wrong. It's not something to be suppressed. It's not something like, oh my God, how is this happening? It's quite normal. The survival of the species depends upon it. Because if men and women were not attracted to each other, no one would procreate and we would die out, right? If, if, uh, if being with a woman or being with a man was as fun as uh, eating uh, liver, who'd do it? Besides those people, no one would do it. So that means this thing is natural and it's normal. Right? We don't see it as a burden from God, or we don't see it as something as a punishment, or anything like that. It's completely normal. Just like having an appetite for food and drink. Do we say that's wrong? No, it's in us. Everybody has that. Because if you didn't have the appetite for food and drink, if you didn't like it, you wouldn't do it. And then if you wouldn't do it, you wouldn't live, you'd die. So those what are called qara'is, they're in there because they ensure their survival of the individual and their survival of the species. Lazim has to be there. So as I said, the prophetic responsibilities, the teachings don't say to suppress or eliminate this. It's not about suppression or elimination, but it's using it in the right way. Why? Because it, we call this ni'mah. When you have a blessing, when it's a gift from Allah, what do you do with it? Use it in the right way. You have two eyes, you have two ears, you have a nose, you smell, you taste. Use them all in the right way. So don't look at something you're not supposed to look at. Don't listen to things you're not supposed to listen to. Don't say things you're not supposed to say. Why? Because it's a gift. Someone gives you a gift, right? Like if your grandmother gave you a, a gift, like a new toy, remote car, you know, that you, or you know, a, a drone or something like that, and you're flying it around, and, but you're doing all sorts of weird things with it. You attach a camera to the drone, and then you fly it over the girl's gym, and you're doing all sorts of nasty things. What would the grandmother think of you then? This is what you do with my gift? They give this to you to, yeah, to, to use it in the right way, and then you abuse it? That's what we do with ourselves. We abuse the, the gift of sight, we abuse the gift of hearing, the gift of smell, all those things. So use the gifts as they're meant to be used. So, does Islam put certain kind of restriction or criteria in the relationship between men and women who, who have attraction to one another? Yeah, it does. Why? Why does it do that? Is it to burden us? Is it to make our life miserable? Is it to suppress your rights? No, none of those things. It's actually to make life better. It's to make life balanced. It's to make not just your individual life better, but everybody's life. Better. And that's one of the things that many people don't understand about Islam or something like Islam when we look at community and society is that the community has rights, the society has rights. In Western societies today, the only criteria they have for a relationship between one and another is something they call what? Anyone know? Consent. 
You've heard about that before? Consent? So that means that as long as we consent, in other words, I say okay and you say okay, we can do whatever we want with one another. There's no limits. Anything that we want to do, I said okay, you say okay, then it's okay. That doesn't make it okay. Because perhaps what you want in the moment and what I want in the moment is not right either for me or you. Neither in the moment or later on. Right? We may not have the ability to make that decision for ourselves. And definitely, it may not be the right thing, not just for me and you, but everybody else. Right? Because when we talk about relationship between man and woman, we're not just talking about the two in the moment. We're talking about repercussions afterwards. We're talking about families. We're talking about community. We're talking about the greater society. So when you make that decision, it's not just, it's not just you and that person. There's much more at stake than this. And so if there's much more at stake, then you don't really have the right to determine all by yourself if it's right or not. You can't have that because you're affecting so many other people besides yourself. It can't be that way. So, there are certain principles between the two. What's the minimum? What is the minimum that has to be done? There are certain parts of the body, both men and women, they should cover in front of one another. Slightly different for men than women, but nevertheless, the main idea is modesty. The main idea is Rather than put ourselves in a situation that we may later regret, we want to desexualize the relationship. Because Allah could have said, Khalas, uh, women, they don't have to wear hijab, but they have to stay home, they can't go outside. Stay in the house. That way, you'll never have an interaction that you don't want. He didn't say that. They're part of society. They are supposed to go out. They are supposed to interact. They are supposed to be teachers and doctors and nurses and bus drivers and everything else. They are supposed to do all those things. But we want to do it in a way that is what we would say desexualized. In other words, they're not an object, they're a person. And if you don't believe me, walk across the street, you show me one advertisement about anything over there across the street that doesn't have the sexualized body of a woman. Show me one. Show me any instance of a woman being used except she's made into an object. You won't find it, I know you won't find it. Open any magazine. Look at any TV ad, look at any TV show. So the whole idea that somehow women can be respected and not sexualized by this society, that's ridiculous, it's nonsense. We just elected a president who boasted and bragged about how he would abuse women, right? So what are people talking about? That's nonsense. So by the same token, we don't say that women are to be um, suppressed in that sense and forced to do something they don't want to do. But at the very least, we can have an appreciation for why there are certain rules in place. And it goes both for men and women, right? And oftentimes men ignore these things. I don't know how many times I've been in Juma and the guy in front of me is uh, making sujood and it's like, you know, the plumber's underneath my sink, right? I don't want to see his backside at all, but he's wearing skinny jeans and I'm seeing his form. That's just as bad as the girl who wears it. There's no difference. But we put our emphasis on what girls do and what women do, and we neglect what men do. So men also should be modest in what they wear, right? And, and, and the things that shows from underneath. So uh, the clothing should be loose fitting, it should be not transparent, it should be comfortable, and it shouldn't be sexualizing, right? It shouldn't make an object, either man or women, out of the two. So that's one rule. Second rule, what about being alone somewhere? Men and women who are not married, or, or in other words, are, can get married if they were, they're not brother and sister, not aunt and nephew and that type of thing. They should not be in a place by themselves where they have the presumption of being alone. In other words, not being heard and not being seen by anyone else. That's, that's the, the haram. What about if we're in a group and we're outside? I can't tell you haram. I can tell you maybe I wouldn't do it, but I wouldn't say haram, I wouldn't say, you know, this is the limit, but this is the limit. If anything, just don't ever put yourself in a situation where you're alone with a member of the opposite sex in a closed space, where you guys believe you're alone, or you actually are alone. This is where, what the hadith is talking about, the shaitan third shuma. That shaitan will be the third one amongst them. And then that would also extend that any physical contact between the two also should be avoided. 
So being alone or being uh, in any physical contact. Outside of this, however, it's going to be more about, I would call a negotiation. It's going to depend upon the, the culture and the environment where you come from. I have been in countries where uh, I literally stayed three, four days. I didn't see a single woman in the street. Muslim country, yeah. I didn't see a single woman at all. Khalas. And I started to wonder, do they actually have women here? Or is it only men or what? They, that's their culture. They didn't go out. I've been in other countries where I did see the women, but they would walk on different streets than we would walk on, the men. So they were there, but they were walking on different streets. That was a different country. Another country I've been to, where men and women are walking and using the same doorways and same things and sharing taxis and other things like this. So these are kind of cultural things. And to take one cultural application and say it has to be the same for everybody. Do all women have to wear black abaya from head to toe? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That is the practice of a particular country. Do women have to dress modestly where they should be covering it, you know, everything besides their hands and their face and their feet? Yeah. But the colors they choose, uh, the outfit they choose, if they want a long, a long shirt, a blouse, whatever it might be, track suit, who cares? None of that is pertinent. The important thing is that the general concept is being applied, not how you make it look like in colors. In Africa, you go to any of the African countries in West Africa or North Africa, they were all different colors. They don't wear black and white. They wear blue and turquoise and purple and all these different colors. In certain countries in Arabia, they were all black. Certain country, other countries, they were all white. Everybody's different. But the idea, the general concept is there. But unfortunately, what I've seen in these societies is that men don't follow the same practice. I don't know how many times I've seen a guy who has his wife completely like blacked out and he's wearing a Mickey Mouse t-shirt and uh, capri shorts. Doesn't make sense, right? If he's gonna be like that with his wife, then you also should be you know, wearing a certain modesty as well. And that's why I think many women get frustrated with men because they see this, as I said, Tanakhud contradiction. How can it be that we have to be like this where you can walk on the beach in your capri shorts and your t-shirt and then the woman head to toe. So, addition what you think? I think we still have probably Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Can the most I mean, you can go on. The dinner will be late today, so we can see half time. Okay. So let's just jump to some types of relationships that happen between men and women who are not husband and wife and not family. What are the situations I could possibly find myself in? I thought of these four. They may not be limited to this, but school, university classmate, right? Or someone who's a colleague at work, you work together. Or teacher and student, also. Or maybe there's someone you're thinking about marrying, too. That's also up there. So how do we go about dealing with all of those? So classmate. Someone who's a classmate of yours at school, at university or high school or junior high school. The first thing is that this relationship is one that you didn't choose. It's imposed upon you in order to get an education, right? So that means that, um, should I say to myself, okay, well, if I have to go to school with girls, then I'm just not going to go to school then. Because, you know, stuck for the law. I can't be in that environment. No, stuck for the law. Because your education is important. And because women are there, does not necessarily pose any type of uh, uh, barrier for you to receive that education. I just told you what the haram was. Don't be with, alone with her in a place where there's only the two of you. Don't touch her with unnecessarily. Outside of this, right, there is no uh, you know, imposed restriction upon you. And told Dhamirak, as we say. So, don't, don't use that as kind of a, a way to say, okay, I'm not gonna get an education because I can't be around this person, I can't be around that person. Then lock yourself in your house and don't go outside. People think the Prophet was this kind of utopia and fish haram, fish haram, but there are people who got drunk. There are women who didn't wear hijab. In fact, 
you may be surprised to know that there are women who are topless who are walking out on the street because for women who were who were bondsmaiden was different than the woman who's a free woman. This was all in the Prophet Medina. So it wasn't like the situation that you think. When uh, Fadl ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, looked at a woman of Khuthaymiyyah, that he, who was a beautiful woman, what did he do? Did he tell Khuthaymiyyah, Safar Allah, go, go away, inti fitna? No, he didn't say a word to her. What did he do? He took Fadl ibn Abbas' face and he turned it this way. He's like, don't look at her. So he didn't blame the person that he was looking at, but the person who's doing the looking. That's the one who's a responsibility. So that means to men, no matter how she's dressed, it does not give you the right to leer and look. She's dressed the wrong way? That's her problem. But it's not your problem. It's her problem. Your problem is, are you looking or you're not looking? Yes, is it harder to look when you have to walk down the beach and women, yeah, maybe, okay, we can give you that. It's not easy. But it still remains your problem. It's not her problem. She has to deal with her own problems, you deal with your problem. So classmates means that you go and you do the thing that you have to do. What are the responsibilities with your classmates for male or female? Yeah. As in any relationship, la daran wa la diran. No harm, no reciprocating of harm. No matter how that person is, what they look like to you, what you think they are, you should not initiate any harm to them nor should you reciprocate. They do something you don't, it doesn't give you an excuse to do something back. It's not your right. It's not your right to lecture them or tell them how to dress or any of those type of things, or to judge them. No harm or reciprocation of harm. You cooperate for the benefit of learning. You have a lab partner who's male or female or female, so what? Do the lab, it's okay. Let's say, right, in the confines of what we believe to be right. So we can exchange ideas, we can exchange the lab results, we can do all those type of things. So it's built upon mutual respect. And then lastly, concerning classmates, and this is especially for young men or boys, there is no difference between your interaction between a Muslim girl or a non-Muslim girl. Doesn't mean because she's a non-Muslim girl you can joke and flirt and ha ha and, and then you see the Muslim girl and she just walks down the hall and she says, Salaam alaikum to you and you're like, Waikum salam. Right, and then you go go down the hall, hey, hey, Stacy, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Oh yeah, that's just fault. I don't know about her, she's, you know. Be consistent, right? There's no excuse for you to, you know, for one versus the other. Treat them all with respect. A woman is not less deserving of respect for you because of the way she dresses, or the way she talks to you, or any of those things. Why? Because this is akhlaq. And when we talk about akhlaq, akhlaq comes from inside. It's not a reaction. This is the mistake people make. Well, they treated me bad, so I'm going to treat them bad. This is a reaction. Akhlaq means, right, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi don't say, like the people say, in zalamna zalamna, when ahsanna lam nuhsan. No. Don't say that, because if they're good, we'll be good. And if they're bad, we'll be bad like them. Right? We'll say, in zalamuna, la nadurru. We will not harm them. That's what the Prophet told us to be like. This is character. Character is not that we react and only be good to the nice people. Anyone can do that. But to be right and balanced with everybody, no matter how hard or the way that they treat you. So that's classmates. Work colleagues is, colleagues is similar. All that mentioned for classmates is also true for work people, people you work with. However, um, I would say work, there's some dangers in there that are not with classmates. Namely the idea that if you're working in a particular group, like an office job, generally you might spend a lot of time with the same person. And if they happen to be a person of the opposite sex, then foreseeably you might spend more time with them than you do with your own family. And if that happens, then there's this phenomenon called uh, uh, like emotional infidelity or work wife, work husband. So you confide in them and you tell them about things. And I used to work in, in, in a Muslim country and I saw it happen there too. It's not just non-Muslim countries. Muslim people fall into this trap, right? Where it comes in, she, he sees her, she comes in and she looks a little upset. And be like, Tabi, Malik khair al hasan. Wallahi, what's it? Call us. 
right? Once, once they open that door, right? When there becomes an emotional attachment, then it's very dangerous for what can happen after that. So one has to be careful, right? That it stays within the, the, the confines of mutual respect and don't allow the relationship to get too emotionally uh, personal and attached to the degree that, you know, I look forward to meeting this person at work because then I felt fun. Then I can tell them, and, well, don't you have family? Don't you have even perhaps your own husband or your own wife to do that with? But yet it's easy for this to happen in a work environment. So you have to be extra cautious when that happens. Teachers and students, this is an important one too. And unfortunately, in the Muslim community, we have issues with this. The teacher, the sheikh, the imam, whoever, is not immune from feeling attracted to what other men are attracted to. Yeah, and you don't think, عشان فلان ده بسلي شيخ وبتاع وكذا وشايب يعني ملايكة. No. He's a man. And like other men who feel what other men feel. So don't assume on your part that he doesn't have those feelings. In fact, assume otherwise. So the same type of adab should be observed. And I've seen it many times. Oh, Allah, ya Shaykh, I عندي سؤال كده على جنب مش عارف ليش. Fine. It could be a personal question, but even when asking that personal question, it should be within the, the rules that we said before. They don't go alone some, somewhere where they're totally alone. They could be sitting here and there are people far away who can see them. They don't hear what they're saying, but they clearly see them. So they don't have this premise that they're all by themselves. Because it doesn't matter if he's a shaykh or he's an imam or he's illan or fulan or maulana or sahib or sharaf ish. All that doesn't matter. Shara shara. Same rules apply. Doesn't make an exception for people who seem to be above those type of rules. No one is above the rules. That being said, uh, you know one has to be cautious with this. Uh, however, we do believe that a man can teach a woman, a woman can teach a man, a woman can be a teacher for men easily. Sayyidah Aisha was one of the greatest teachers of men. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said about her, uh, "Take half of your deen from her." And there are many, many hadith that she only she narrated, especially dealing with family issues and things in the house that only she knew about. We wouldn't know about half of the things, literally, was it not for Sayyidah Aisha. And she narrated to men. She spoke to men and gave them, and she taught them. And she had students. So the etiquettes are observed, even if she was in Ummah Hatim Mubin, radiallahu anha. And then, oh, I got two more slides. Um, Prospective marriage. Women and women interested in seeking possibility of marriage are encouraged to engage in dialogue. We call this al khitbah. What we did today earlier is called al khutbah. And al khitbah means that we are engaging in figuring out do we want to do this or not. And that's mashru'ah, and that's perfectly fine, and you should do that. We're long past the age of meeting your wife or your husband on your wedding night. Used to be like that. And you might think, oh, that's crazy. How could you marry someone you never met? How's that possible? But the thing is, it's like you met. It's as if you met. Why? Because you all come from the same street. You are raised in the same neighborhood. Her parents know your parents, right? And they know the other parents. And they eat the same food. And they dress the same way. And they act in the same way. So all of the things that you would need to know, prospectively, are kind of already known. So it facilitated things like this. Nowadays, you don't know what your neighbor does, even if they're Muslim. You don't know what's going on or where they're coming from or that type of thing. So no, you have to be smart and you have to find out and you can't make assumptions because everyone's gonna present their best behavior. And this is something for the rest of your life. So especially my advice to young girls is, you know, don't rush. This is something that's, that's a big deal. It's not a little thing. Uh, and also get other opinions involved. It's always good to have a male opinion as well. Because sometimes we're able to smoke out the imposter and the girls aren't able to do it. We, have, we can tell if this guy is uh, a pretender or a contender. So, you know, use all of that at your disposal. Don't, uh, don't dismiss it. However, um, it's very difficult to get married today. It's not easy for the young people. Why? Because the communities are not the same. We haven't developed our communities to the degree where we make it easy for people to find 
prospective marriage partners. Rather, it's quite hard. Uh, so the, the groundwork really has to be done with the community. We have to have more cohesive communities. We have to have more social functions where people are getting to know one another and actually behaving like neighbors in the community so that these things can be facilitated. But it's very hard to marry someone that you've never met and you don't know their family and it's the first time that you're coming across them. If you ask your parents' generation, I would bet nine times out of 10, oh yeah, I met my wife because she was the sister of my friend at college, or she was someone that uh, uh, my cousin's uh, teacher, or did, yeah, I mean, there was, they knew someone who knew them, right? Or they had a relationship going on. But nowadays people get on the internet and people look for all sorts of ways, someone out of nowhere, out of the blue, coming. And that's, it's a difficult thing to go through that. So take your time in asking the right questions and getting to know such a person. We call this al khidma And that can include exchange of emails, it can include talking on the phone. However, you're not married, right? So the thing about being alone with them, no. But everything outside of that, in order to make a proper decision, it's okay. So, um, Finally, online behavior. So this is relatively new, maybe a decade old, but it's something that is becoming more and more of an issue. So the, the first thing that I think is important to point out is anything you say online, it's like you said it for real. What do I mean by that? Like if you said someone to someone, oh, you're a liar, you're this, and you said it face to face, we know that's pretty bad. If you say it on a Facebook, uh, chat, it's just as bad, perhaps even worse. Why is it worse? Hmm? Because you're hiding and saying it. No. You're not saying it. A lot of other people can see it, right? If you if you uh, make a comment on their post, things oh you lie, you cheat, you you you're so full of it. If you said that in private to them, that's pretty bad. But if you say that on the Facebook, then all of their friends and your friends see it. And the friends of friends, whatever your privacy settings are. So literally, you can talk to me about hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people seeing you said that. So that makes it kind of worse in that sense. So anything that you say online, right, it's kalam. Right, it's like you said it with your tongue. It's a form of communication, it counts the same way. So be just as careful in how you say things to people and how you bring it to them. So don't say anything you wouldn't say to somebody's face. It's real, like you said, you hide. No, they can't see me. I have like a, you know, I have a fake name. They don't know who I am. No. Don't hide behind anonymity. That's, you know, uh, it will come back. Don't assume that they have privacy either. Don't assume that picture that you sent, the tweet that you retweeted, or any of those things that no one is seeing that. Because you have your privacy settings. Anyone can see it anytime. WikiLeaks prove that. Anyone can get your stuff anytime. And then it lasts forever, right? If you do something to somebody and then it goes in the Google top 10 list, every time somebody looks up that person's name, they're gonna see that. And that's what they'll know about them. Anytime a college wants to think about accepting them for school, anytime an, an employer Googles them, and believe me, all the employers Google the people that they're gonna go work for them. And they find, oh, he was associated with this scandal, Khalas Badesh. It's a stain for life. It's unfair, it's not right. It's the way it is right now. So be really careful about how you talk about people, how you say to them, you know, whether they're the same sex or the opposite sex, be quite careful about this. So being anonymous on the net is not an excuse to berate, bully, ignore etiquette that you wouldn't have face to face. So I think what the result in Baghdad, I don't want to stop here. Um, inshallah, we'll, um, we'll take five minutes for questions. You know, I, I like all the youth to get involved and ask Sheikh Walid to Walid, and then we'll, uh, we'll have Maghrib, inshallah. I will take the last point from Sheikh Walid about the social media, and tomorrow, inshallah, we'll have a very uh, interesting debate about the social media tomorrow. Please, please get prepared. And tonight, inshallah, the debate about legalizing uh, marijuana, Medical marijuana, please also get ready, okay? So five minutes for a question before we start the What is the reservation for the friendship online between boys and girls? Does it consider Kolwa or not Kolwa? Including phone, chat, all of that. So they, they think they don't see each other, but everybody's by themselves. 
That's a good question. Yani uh, khalwa, as we understand, is physically being alone so that mumkin ta'til fahisha. When you're online, that's not really possible. But I would still advise against it because it could be a preliminary step. So people should, I think they should operate as if they were physically alone. So if you're in a private chat, in other words, it's just you and them and no one else can see it, assume people can see it. Assume your parents could see that or her friends or her parents could see that. And that, and before all else, sah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see that, right? So don't assume that you're completely alone and speak to them in a way that you would normally speak to them. So that means exchange of emails and things like this, uh, chat rooms and, and via Facebook chat, bil-adab, right? There's nothing wrong with seeing a, a schoolmate or a classmate and saying, Salaam alaykum, alaykum salam, how's your day? Alhamdulillah, good to see you, Hassan. Right, But again, we've lost kind of the idea of how to be shafin kun ma'adibin ma'abad, right? And I think social media uh, exasperates the problem, makes it worse. Because when you're so much time on social media, I've met kids and then I meet them in real life. Ken Haikal Udemia. Like it's not a person. They don't know how to speak, they don't know how to talk because they're so consumed with the social media. So rather than spend all your time on social media, try to make real relationships. Spend more time on your real relationships rather than the ones uh, online. But in the work and school environment, like I have no problem um, to go to my professor, obviously, and, and like with everyone is watching and ask questions, and we learn from each other, you know, with our classes. And we have a mentor and professors that, that we look up to, and, and we have equal access to knowledge as the other um, guys in our class. Mm -hmm. In our class, but I feel like in the masjid, uh, uh, the ladies, or I don't, I don't want to speak for everyone, including. At least me, I feel like I don't have equal access to that knowledge because I feel like there's some sort of like stigma with speaking to the sheikh or speaking to any any male leader because unfortunately we have usually more male leaders than female leaders. So how do you recommend dealing with that? Um, it's very valid points. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that oftentimes women are treated like second class citizens in the masjid. They're given some room that's more like a closet than it is an actual room. Um, I think, in my experience in the past 15 years or so, and uh, out of the students I've had contact with, or people like yourself in this type of general forum, I've had much, in terms of numbers, way more women, number one, and in terms of enthusiasm, much more from them than the men. Than the, than the men. And so to me, that would be then give them more access. They should be the ones in the front and then the women the men should be in the back watching a video if we're going to do if we're going to be fair right so i think um you know my advice to women is that you will find you not necessarily you will not necessarily find don't expect i should say don't expect to find male advocates on your behalf you may have to do it yourself but again, if you do it yourself, I would also do it in a manner that is respectful and not necessarily harmful to the people who just don't, don't realize what's going on, right? Allah SWT named a surah after someone who did it for themselves. Surah Al-Mujadila or Al-Mujadila Alati tujadu zawjiha wa tashtati ilallahi wa allahi yasma wa tahawurakuma Right? She was complaining about her husband and her treatment and so forth. Who heard her complaint? And who named the surah after her? Rabbul Isa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So kind of bringing this and understanding that you may have to do this. Say the Aisha, once you heard the hadith about how, um, you know, a man shouldn't pray with a woman or a dog in front of him. She, she was mad. She was like, yeah, are we the same as the dogs? That we talk like this? That can't be right. Right, so the idea of, you know, sometimes men being, let's back a little word, they don't understand, they don't see it. Usually it has to be brought there to their attention. Um, 
However, that being said, and you're in a college environment, you're probably aware of some of the arguments that go on. This, I would say, new kind of wave, it's not really new, but it's been there a long time, of this feminism, where it actually attacks Islam and makes the assumption that because most of the, all of the prophets and most of the Dharma have been men, there's some type of inherent bias against women within the deen or the way the deen is interpreted. That's a slippery slope and a dangerous road to go down. While I'm not denying that there are certain men who may fall into that category, but to take sort of a absolute categorical uh, accusation against the Sharia, that I cannot support. Uh, even though definitely there are instances where we can say that you know it's not right what, what people are doing. I think every masjid uh, board committee should have uh, not just one woman who's called a woman's representative, that's wrong. Might as well have a man's representative then, what does that mean? But she should be the secretary, the treasurer, the president, the vice president, it doesn't matter. It's not the khilafah, right? We're not talking about uh, al Uzma, we're talking about, you know, Swayat Idarat, yeah. Even though the people on the board think they run the, the universe, you actually just make sure you collect the zakah and make sure that you Meshit is functioning uh, as it should, and the electricity bill is being paid, and it's uh, welcoming to everybody. This is your responsibilities to do, right? You're not running a Dawla al you're not running, you know, Khilaf uh, al So that means women have, should have as much access and as much say, and I would say even as much authority in many things. And oftentimes the women's, as we talked about earlier this evening, the feminine versus masculine. You know, it's in need of a woman's touch many times. Um, unfortunately, our masajid, most of them in North America, if you look at them, aesthetically, uh, they're, they're offensive, right? You, you don't like being in them. There's something about it, it's like an office building, or it's like something they didn't think about. You know, how Islam is not just talking about functionality, but there's also a beauty about it. Everything should be beautiful, right? And if you look to the Masajid in the Muslim world, there's just something about them when you walk into them. You walk into uh, Suleimani or Sultan Ahmed or uh, uh, Jama al Azhar or Mashal al Husseini or Ibn Tulun or Jama al Umuwi in Damascus, and there's, it's different, right? There's something that was behind that that understood that this was a place of sanctuary, of soul searching, of connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it shouldn't look like your local office max on the inside, right? So I think, you know, many men are not privy to that side that they should be in tune with and many women are. So we need women to help with things like this. And the masjid is for everybody. It's for men and for women, it's for children. It's not a men's club. There are some Muslim countries, rarely does a woman go to the masjid. That's some Muslim countries. Here, that's not the case. It has to be completely equal. Um, I don't think there has to be a separate men and women entrance, for example, it's not necessary. Prophet Swas, so I said, didn't have a separate men and women's entrance. Uh, they could be on a mezzanine, they could be in the back. I would prefer a more flexible kind of design in terms of the musalla, where they can choose depending on the numbers that are there. So if there's only like one row of men uh, downstairs, and then the mezzanine, which is tighter, is full of women, why would I have them be upstairs? Come go downstairs and pray behind the men, there's nothing wrong with that. So to have that flexibility, to do that when the situation calls for it, to me is a much better solution than saying, you know, you're in this room and you have the video screen, well, that's, I think they have as much right to the male speakers. The Prophet said them would set aside days, one or two days a week where he, only for the women. So if there's an Imam, there's a Shaykh, Mufti, whatever, he should definitely have a time where the women have uh, their own access uh, to that. And again, who are you gonna talk to about this? Usually the people in charge don't wanna listen. But um, doesn't mean that you don't say it anyway.